press the button. Okay, so it's been with some trepidation that I've decided to talk on this subject, as it causes a lot of heat and not much light, um, both within and outside the church. Um, I also realise you can't cover two subjects like Genesis and evolution in one talk, um, so I've got to be very selective. Anyway, within the church, there are those who believe the world was made in six days or 24 hours, uh, less than, say, 6,000 or 10,000 years ago, depending on how you consider their genealogies, um, because there is some incompleteness, as we see in Matthew 1.8. Um, on the other hand, there are Christians who believe that evolution has happened, and within this group, there's a very wide range of viewpoints. Um, for those who believe that God sort of started it off and then let the world run like clockwork without sort of God interfering. And this is referred to as deism, which is one sort of version, if you like, um, of theism. And other Christians believe that some kind of evolution has taken place, but God had to specially intervene on some occasions. For example, to bridge the gap between non-life and life, animals and humans, between animal consciousness and human consciousness, and possibly other stages, such as going from microevolution to macroevolution. And some would believe that, that maybe God had a hand in, in doing that. Clearly, God can do anything, so we can't really constrain God in any way. Um, critics of this view say it's God of the gaps approach. We often hear that. And if we don't know something has happened, we use God to fill the gap. However, now to this kind of criticism, I would turn around and say when atheists are faced with questions, their response might be, oh, one day science will provide an answer. I call this the science of the gaps argument. And we don't know the answer, we use science to fill the gap. Some evangelical Christians, of, of several of whom are my good friends of mine, they believe in evolution, but ev maintain that evolution is a continuous process, somehow guided by God, leading to a final cause. Um, it's directed by God and doesn't happen just by chance, though there are some chance elements. And so that's, that's one view. When we move to non-religious evolutionists, we again have a controversy because neo-Darwinism says that life evolved through two processes, mutations and natural selection, which is survival of the fittest. And I feel like that these days, surviving. <laughs> um, some evolutionists believe these two processes are inadequate to explain the rate of evolutionary progression. So there are uh, evolutionists out there who don't agree with neo-Darwinism. For example, most, we know that most mutations are detrimental. And there's a leading group of scientists called the Altenberg 16 who doubt whether mutation and natural selection can drive evolution. And they believe that a whole new theory is needed. And if I was to ask each one of you what your views are on the subject, we'd get a different answer from everybody, because we all have different views. But perhaps we can find some common ground. So what I'm going to do to start with is I'm going to try and, and to put down some things which I think might be in common. To begin with, we've got to define evolution, because it means different things to different people. And the simplest definition is that evolution is simply change brought about by genetic modification. And I think most people would agree that, because we know that things do change and we don't know that genes get modified. We know, for example, this happens through bacterial resistance. Um, we know that bugs are getting resistant to antibiotics and we're now getting into a very difficult situation. You've probably seen a lot of it on TV, where they say now there are some um, diseases which they can't actually treat, and so because of bacterial resistance. Some have argued that we can't have evolution because it hasn't been observed before our eyes, right? It's a process in the past. But in fact, it has been shown with a bacterium called e. e. coli. You've probably heard about that. That gets around quite a lot, that one. It's been followed over 31,500 generations since 1988, showing a genetic change. So you can actually demonstrate these changes in the lab. But, however, it's still E. coli. And I, I, I know a, a young person just finished his PhD who's a, a keen Christian, and he, he demonstrated evolution in the lab working with yeast cells. And you can, you can get through a lot of large number of replications when you've got these small beasties, because they replicate a lot. Uh, but, but in the end, we still have yeast cells, and these yeast cells have developed certain characteristics which made them different. One of the things we have to realise is that whatever the theory we need to, to explain life, evolution is a biological theory. 
And one of the problems is some people try to apply evolution to everything. You know, everything has evolved. Like we talk about the evolution of a class society, which is how communism was, and we look what's happened to communism. And then some people say religion has evolved. Such extensions are not legitimate because evolution is a biological theory. And so once you start taking out of that, you're in a different ball game. So I'm going to try my next picture. Ah, general thoughts. As I've already said, we've got two of them already. Evolution is about change. <clears throat> evolution is a biological theory. And what is very important is our beliefs about evolution do not affect our salvation. And that is so important because there's so many people get upset and somehow think that Christianity is being somehow sidelined because of evolution. It's not true. Our beliefs, we are saved by grace, not by intellect. Um, and so we can disagree in a friendly way. And this is the way it should be. And then for Christians, their view of evolution will depend on how they view the first few chapters of Genesis. And we probably have all very different views on that. And then we know that Jesus, Paul and Peter all referred to Adam. Does that have anything to do with their scientific viewpoint of these people? Not necessarily. And you can do all sorts of arguments either way. But the point is, it's a fact that Jesus, Peter and Paul referred to Adam. The next thing is the Bible is not a book of science. Although it does deal with similar things, as science does, but it uses the language of appearance. And science and the Bible don't ex necessarily exclude each other. And the Bible couldn't be scientific, as clearly science is complicated and it keeps changing. You know, we, we keep updating what we think about science. And the Bible was written by people who were inspired by God, but it was not dictated like the angel Gabriel with, with the Koran. Um, it was filtered through the culture of the time. And some things reflect beliefs at the time and how we speak generally about things. For example, we describe, there they describe things as how they appear in the Bible rather than how they are. It's what's called the language of appearance. For example, it was believed for a long time the earth was fixed and the sun moved. Now, we now believe in the heliocentric theory. That's with the sun at the centre and the earth going around it. In the Old Testament, we read, Tremble before him all the earth, yet the world is established, it shall never be moved. That's 1 Chronicles 16.30. The phrase never be moved never is repeated in Psalm 93.1 and Psalm 104.5. Also, in 1 Samuel 2.8, we've got, For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. Here we have a picture of the world being set on pillars. The earth is fixed, but then we have verses that the sun moves. Like, for example, in Genesis 15, 17, it says, when the sun had gone down. Okay, well that, we all would go along with that. That's the appearance. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. That's Ecclesiastes 1, 5. And also in Psalm 19, we told that the sun stood still in Joshua 10, 13. So it's a language of appearance. And today we talk about the sun rising, the language of appearance, so I can understand the phrase. You don't need to agree in astronomy. And Augustine in the 4th century said, God wanted to make Christ Christians, not mathematicians. Um, fortunately, we can be both. <laughs> and we use allegorical language all the time. And as a counsellor, I, I like to use metaphors. In everyday speech, we might say, I must fly down to the shops, <laughs> or I must run over the accounts. Uh, and there are times I'd like to do that. <laughs> um, when it comes to the Bible and science, the writer of Genesis, soon to be Moses, knew only three types of plants, grass, herbs, and trees. And similar comments apply to sea, cre sea creatures, bats, and creeping things. And in Leviticus 11, it talks about clean and unclean creatures. Birds are listed with bats as they fly, weasels and mice with lizards as they crawl, and insects credited with having four feet. Again, it's the language of appearance. So, all right, let's bearing that in mind, let's start with Genesis. And, of course, one of the, the difficult here, of course, it's in Hebrew. And Hebrew is an interesting language. It has no vowels, and you read it from right to left. Um, and one of the problems, of course, in, in understanding the Bible is to know what the Hebrew words actually mean. <clears throat> now, when it comes to um, Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2... 
It's simple narrative, but with poetic elements. It's not either one or the other, but it has a, a little bit of poetic framework. Of course, you get things repeated. Um, the morning and the evening, such and such a day. And it goes through like this. So there's a certain um, a poetic uh, framework. And Hebrew poetry uses couplets. It's called a sort of a two-line parallelism, where you get two parts. Like, for example, Proverbs 15 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Those are two contrasting things. Or in Psalm 92.1, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to thy name, O Most High. So the second part reflects the first part. So you've got this couplet. So one very important word is the word yom, meaning day. And of course this comes up right through um, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And we, you've probably all heard of Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. Um, and it has many different Jewish meanings. And this is where you get a lot of debate as to what it actually means. For example, uh, first of all, we see there it's a period of daylight or daytime. Because God called the light day and the darkness night, the word Yom, the day. Then it can be 24 hours. And there was an evening and there was a morning one day. So that, in that case, it's both. The phrase, and there was evening and there was morning, is repeated for six days, that same phrase. So there was a kind of, a, as I say, a poetic pattern. Uh, day seven is different because there's no mention of evening and morning on the seventh day. It now refers to an epoch, a time of rest. And this is described very much in Hebrews. We speak about entering into rest. And so we are now referring there for a, a different length of time again. And the other thing, too, is that the use of the definite article. You find that in day one, we find day one, day two, day three, up to day five, and then it's the sixth day and the seventh day. So there is a difference between those two days. And that, in, and in some way, is a kind of emphasis. So there's something special about those two days. Continue on with Yom. Um, we have, in the day that the Lord made the heavens and the earth... Now, that's Genesis 2.4. Their day means a longer period. Okay? Um, then we've got one day is a thousand years with God. That mentioned in 2 Peter 3.8 and Psalm 94. And then day is also mentioned to denote a period of time, 65 times in the Bible. Its plural form is used as age, six times, as year, five times, as years, four times. It is also used as a month, two years, or even the lifetime, and also in that day occurs a hundred times. So we've got different meanings for the word yom. Um, now creation did not always seem to be instantaneous. For example, on day three, the earth brought forth fruit trees that grew from seeds and bore fruit. So we have, again, an element of time expansion, not a quick process. You don't grow seeds quickly, and when I look at my garden, I think, when are they going to appear? Um, God said, let the earth bring forth, not let there be. Let the earth bring forth, not let there be. So there's a difference. And we see that um, in day one, day two, and day three. And continuing on with our, our, our good friend uh, Yom, uh, it speaks about, and I'm just saying, about the idea of bringing forth rather than let there be. And that's in days four, five, and six, all suggesting a period of time. On day five, the initial mention of birds could also be translated as insects. And these would have been needed for pollination. So again, it depends on what the Hebrew word means. Then we've got, interesting enough, God spoke twice on each of two days. You may have noticed that, but some of them is just once, and then in some days it's twice. On day three, God created the dry land, and then life in the form of vegetation. And, of course, does that mean that God, through a creative act, crossed the life-non-life -life boundary there? Then on day six, we have, let the earth bring forth living creatures. Then God created heavens. Again, a separate act. Let us make man, and so on. Again, crossing a boundary, this time perhaps between animals and humans. Um, you can read all sorts of things into this, of course. And humans is definitely are different than animals in that, as humans, we are to have domination over the animal kingdom. That is our privilege, but our responsibility at the same time. Also, too, let us make man our own image. So we are spiritual, 
and we're made in some way in God's image. We can, as it were, I suppose, think God's thoughts after him. We can understand the creation. We can do science. Because somehow or other, we have something of the divine within us. And then in Genesis 2, Adam named all the animals. Well, that could take a while. Possibly it's a local version that he's naming the animals for. I don't know. Um, and then Adam said, at last, when Eve arrived. Now, I don't know what that means. Uh, <laughs> Um, but the words indicate a period of time. That word at last is used elsewhere in Genesis, so there's a period of time there as well. So what I'm trying to say is that the, the whole question of time and yom is not straightforward. You can read into this a lot of different things. Um, okay, another word which I think is important is the word create. Now, the word that's used, bara, means create out of nothing. And then there's the word asar, which means make and appoint. And these are used in Genesis chapter 1. And some, re some people regard them as interchangeable, and others regard them as different, which I tend to support myself. I think they are different words. For example, bara, meaning create of nothing, is, is when it's associated with God. It's used in relation to the heaven and the earth. In verse 1, we've got bara in verse 1. Sea creatures and birds, verse 21. And Adam and Eve, verse 27. So it's used in three particular places in that sense. The word asar has a lot of different meanings, including make and appoint. And it's used with all the other creative acts. So there's a difference of type of creation if you go into the Hebrew words. It could also be argued that the appearance of the moon and the stars, which appears in is it, um, four, day four, um, represents the, the appointment, that they're already there and they've been appointed. There are a lot of ways of looking at that. And we need the sun at the beginning to start off the days anyway. Um, so this is often discussed as being controversial, but it can be fitted into a sensible framework. And interesting enough, the two days are used together in one place. That's in, in Genesis 2, verse 3, where it says, And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he had rested from all his work that he had prepared, that's Bara, for making. So you've got bara and asar right together. So it would seem to me that these are different words. So anyway, those are two words which I think are absolutely critical um, to understand um, Genesis. All right, so let's look at now um, a bit more about Genesis generally. Um, I've already said that Genesis 1 and 2 are not poetry, but simple narrative with poetic elements. One of the interesting things is that if you read the story of Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and then follow on, it has continuity. It's not as though something, there's a major gap between Genesis 3 and Genesis 4, where you're starting about who begat who. Um, so there is a kind of a continuity which suggests some sort of historical continuity. And so I would say there, as number four, that... Um, the, the Genesis, and also through the other books of Moses, the other four books... There is a continuity. Um, now, what's an interesting point, which I, I'm, I'm not quite sure this is the right place to put it, but it's an interesting one. Animal suffering raises a lot of questions. There's nothing in the Bible that says that animal suffering was a result of the fall. You have a good look. You will not find it. The animal world is, is what I see as a, a balanced ecosystem. You know, if one, one bit gets out of haywire, then everything goes wrong. And sometimes if you kill off one species, a worse one arises because that's let loose. And so it's a balanced ecosystem. And what I would suggest, and this has been suggested to me, when sin entered the world, death first of all passed upon all humans, not all living things. It's in Romans 5.12 it speaks about that. And then Romans 8.20 speaks about creation being subject to corruption and decay as distinct from death. And with the presence of Satan in the garden, it could be argued that evil predated the fall and could have corrupted part of cre creation, causing animal pain and suffering. That's a viewpoint, all right? I'm just throwing it out there for different suggestions. What I find interesting, and this occurred to me when I was thinking about this, in Isaiah 11, verses 6 to 8, it speaks about a future new world order where the wolf will dwell with the lamb, the leopard will lay loud down with the kid. And to me, this tells us something about God's original intention for the animal kingdom. Will they be the same creatures? Will they be the same 
lion and the same kid or not? Um, or is it a metaphor for peace in a new order? Okay, I'm not giving any answers, I'm giving some questions. Uh, and then we read about um, God planted a garden and put man in it. What was happening outside the Garden of Eden? Right? What was happening? We don't know, do we? We don't know. We read there outside later on, but what's going on outside? We don't know. Uh, all we know is that Cain found a wife and built a city in the land of Nod. So this raises a whole lot of discussion and debate as to what was going on outside. Um, moving on, now I want to say something about Genesis 2. Is Genesis 2 a different story to Genesis 1? Now, there are different views on this. Some would say it refers to a local creation or it's a summary of chapter 1. In the latter case, if it's a summary, this is a Jewish way of writing called recapitulation. Recapitulation is used a lot in Jewish writing where something is repeated for emphasis but from a different framework. And Genesis 2 you would regard as more a topical vantage point rather than perhaps a chronological one. I don't know. For example, we find that Adam is placed in the garden twice. If you look in chapter 2, it says 7 is placed in it and verse 15 is placed in it. We've got these duplication occurs a lot in Genesis. For example, we've got two flood stories and we've got lots and lots of places where the thing is repeated, if you like, for emphasis from a different viewpoint. So it could be argued that chapter 2 is not a creation account at all, but perhaps a close-up of day 6, and other words, a specific part of creation. Now, there are several main differences um, in, <coughs> uh, in, in Genesis 2. First of all, the creation order appears to be different. Man is created for the animals. But when it speaks about the earth, the earth could be a local land. In other words, the Garden of Eden could be a locality, and not necessarily the original creation of plant life because there was no rain, so the plants couldn't grow. And so, therefore, the humans were before the plants. Then the plants got watered. Um, and, it, and we'll say a bit more about it. Men and women are, tr are treated separately. See, in Genesis 1.26, it says, let us make man in our own image, and it means husband, it means man and wife, right? Um, but in Genesis 2, we've got... Uh, um, Dear old Adam runs along and then next month he loses his ribbon and suddenly uh, Eve appears, the mother of all living. Um, so they're treated separately. And then we also see ordinary providence uh, operating in chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. What happened, there was no rain to grow wild plants and no person to cultivate the crops and secure growth. And so two solutions are provided in verses 6 and 7. God sent a rain cloud and God used man to till the garden. So... As I say, the two, there'll be lots of debate over whether they're the same or different. Um, I'm not going to say which one I think, because I'm probably pretty confused. Um, I'm confused about most things, actually. Uh, OK, so we're moving on, still looking at the views of Genesis. Um, this, this is now where we, we look at different ways in which people interpret Genesis. And of course, this is where the controversy comes. Um, so I don't want your brickbacks, thank you. Um, these, are, these are just... Seven views of Genesis. There are others. All right? There are other views. And all of them have some merit and all of them have problems. All right? So, um, first of all, we've got the idea that, that, was, that these seven days are 24 hours. And this means, of course, you have to ignore um, evidence from dating methods. There are about 40 odd standard dating methods which tend to agree on most things. Um, so, you have to deal with that. And, but on the other hand, some of the changes that have happened are put down to the flood. So that's how that tends to operate. The second version is that, that we've already mentioned this, that days represent longer periods of time. And we've already discussed this. But there's also another bit I haven't talked about in time. And it's to do with the tenses in Hebrew. Tenses in Hebrew are very tricky. There's a thing called a pluperfect tense, like I had done this rather than I have done this, pluperfect. And the way it's mentioned in Hebrew is it adds another letter on the end. It's actually, because it reads from right to left, it's, it's, it's the, it looks like the end to us, but it's the front, <laughs> because we're going from right to left. And, but when it's put on the front, and also the word order, tends to suggest 
that we've got a pluperfect tense. So verse 1 might be read as, in the beginning God had created the heavens and the earth. He had created it, so there's something about time here. And in verse 2 we read, we could put it as, the earth had existed, or was already existing, or the earth had become. So even in verses 1 and 2, we've got some question about the timing. And you can also go on and say there's also a gap between days 1 and 2 and between 2 and 3 at the same time. So that's the second view that's often presented, longer periods of time, starting with Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Then the third way is what we call a topical or logical order rather than chronological. Um, and what happens here is that you've got a sort of a parallel here. It's kind of poetic in a way. Like days 4 to 6 run in parallel with days 1 to 3. Sort of a poetic arrangement. For example, in day 1 we have light and the Big Bang would have produced intense heat and a lot of light. And day 4 we have the light bearers, sun, moon and stars. So you've got the, you've got the light and then you've got the light bearers. Uh, the other thing you could add in here is also we have the sun and moon were worshipped in other cultures, whereas here they were relegated, you know, they just sort of tack on. They weren't important. So you could also look at it from that point of view as well. On, t on day two we have the skies and the seas, and on day five they were filled with creatures. On day three we have the dry land, and on day six it's filled with animals and humans. Now there is a slight difference in biblical order of creation and the order of the fossil records, but this is always under debate, because I just read very recently an article which says they found some um, plants. See, originally, um, the uh, plants came after animals. I've got the water right. I'm getting confused myself now. I don't know which is in front and which is behind. So, um, <laughs> but apparently, they found a, um, a form of, of um, it's a red algae, algae, which is much older than expected, which makes it much earlier, something like 1.6 billion years according to the method of measuring it, which predates, which suggests that the plants could have come before um, the rest of creation. So that, that would agree with Genesis. So we, we've got a lot of, you know, um, to and froing on this um, time-wise. But the, what is interesting is the degree of correspondence is striking, particularly when you compare it with other creation counts like the like the Babylonian ones, which are quite fanciful and mythical. Here you've got a straightforward narrative which tends to follow what we find in the fossil record. Another method is what's called the days of assignment. In other words, each day represents an assignment, and they're 24 hours. And this was put forward by a guy called John Walton. And, and he says that basically on the seventh day, God entered into his cosmic temple, which is the universe. Um, and that's where God resided on day seven. And the Genesis account is not so much concerned with material origins, but material functions. You know, this is done for that, and that's done for that. So um, uh, there are some problems with how he interprets the word bara, which is create. Then the other one has got days of revelation. In other words, on the first day, the person who was observing creation, the creation account, saw so much. On the second day, they saw so much. And this, of course, has quite a particular appeal when you first read it, but it, it doesn't seem to fit in with the word asa. There's some problems with that one. The next one is mythical. Now, we've got to be careful here because the word myth is treated very differently in that sort of technical literature or technical sense. It doesn't mean it's just fiction, but rather it's a sacred narrative that serves to underlie and explain a culture and institutions. However, it doesn't seem to fit in with the continuity of the rest of Genesis. And then finally, there's the Darwinian model, and this is often pushed, where our sin is blamed on our evolutionary background. I mean, after all, we're just animals. Um, and our evolving natures are, are, are sort of, hopefully we're getting better. I can't see it, of course, but anyway, we're supposed to be getting better. Um, so there, there's seven views, and there are others as well. Um, take your pick. <laughs> um, a major question is, did Adam and Eve exist? Because the word Adam means mankind, and Eve <coughs> means life. And it's described in Genesis 3.20, um, Eve is described as the mother of all living. And they don't really have proper names until chapter 3. There's this kind of a generic terms 
um, in the first couple of chapters. However, there's no reason why Adam and Eve can't be real people. Maybe the first spiritual people. One person refers to, rather than homo sapiens, homo divinus, divine. In other words, somehow or other, God chose or created two particular people. And of course, there's a lot of debate goes on about male and female genes. Where did the X and Y genes come from? And, and you, can, you can find it on the internet and, and spend hours chasing it around. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so, so much for the genesis. We've got all these different pictures. So I, I guess by now you're confused, but that's all right. You probably have... You, <laughs> We all tend to be fixed in our own ideas. Um, what I want to do now is, is have a look at evolution. Okay, where does this fit into the picture? And the, the, the evolution sometimes is split up into four possible ways or things, changes that are needed. The first is at the microbe level, microbial evolution through natural selection. And we know about this because bacteria mutate. And they become antibiotic resistant. In fact, I nearly died of a superbug seven, seven years ago called Staph aureus. Um, viruses are able to host hop and bacteria can become antibiotic resistant. We know about malaria, for example. There's been a shift, shift there. Um, so the, the, it's well known that we can have um, drug-resistant strains to malaria and for a lot of other things. So we... Microbial evolution is not hard to accept because we see it. The next stage is microevolution, where there's a change in what we call genetic or genotype frequencies that occur over time. And this can be due to mutation, selection, or genetic drift. For example, we can get variations in a species due to selection pressures. And the genetic drift is with... A good example is, and I was in Manchester where I did postgraduate study, it's a very, it was a very black place when I was there in, in 1963. Um, the trees were black, the buildings were black, and what happened was that there was a, a, a genetic shift of the colour of a um, particular kind of moth called the peppered moth. It started off being mainly white, ended up mainly black, because if, if you're on a tree and you're black and the tree's black, then you're going to survive better. So, you know, we can see examples like this of genetic drift can happen. It's still a moth, though, isn't it? Um, then, of course, you get one species which can change a little bit to another. And some of the best examples are on islands, where you get islands which are separated, and so you get slightly different developments. And this was the case with the so-called Darwin finches on the um, um, Galapagos Islands. There was a variation of big size and shape on different islands. And he observed that. But the interesting thing, of course, is the birds can interbreed. And this raises questions about whether there were different species to begin with. But anyway, that's another question. Um, and so variation of those three levels, the microbial, the microevolution, and the speciation, I think are fairly well accepted and established. The big question is macroevolution. That is a change from, from microbes to mammals. Uh, there's a huge gap here. And um, for a good example of this for exa is the development of family of horses. Uh, if you look at a picture of horses, the, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very confusing picture. And we've got the, the sort of the transformation of vertebrates, that is, you've got no spine, to in invertebrates. And then birds, from, if I got the right way around, uh, and birds from reptiles. Right, so you've got these big transformations which take place and lots of debates over whether a bird comes from a dinosaur or is this a dinosaur or actually a bird? And there's been various ones put forward. Archaeopteryx was one well known. There's another one more recently than that. It's got feathers. And it seems to me it's still a bird. Um, but there's a lot of debate as to whether it's in between or not. And so the question here is whether macroevolution is a continuation of microevolution or is there a different process going on? OK, there's a lot of support for what we call common descent. And they have these things called phylogenetic tree, where you start with some beastie here, and the next minute it forms other beasts, and you get this huge tree. Um, and of course, once you start looking at um, that's just a, that's just a bacterial section. That's just one small part of the tree. And of course, you've got to try and decide who begets who and who doesn't. Um, 
And then, of course, um, if you want to look at the whole tree, uh, you can't even see it on that. It's just so much. It's just so much. And the problem is the tree keeps changing. Uh, if you get a textbook one year and you get a textbook next year, you'll find the trees change. They can't make up their mind who begets who. Um, and then, of course, the mammals, which is, um, which is that one. Uh, our humans are somewhere, uh, somewhere in the middle. Um, primates, somewhere in here. Uh, anyway, so, so that's, a, that's another tree. And, of course, some of these things can be linked up if you look at the genes. Anyway, that, I'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. Um, so the next thing I want to do now is, is evidence for evolution. And I think it's important to realise that there is very strong evidence. Otherwise, a lot of people wouldn't believe in it, including Christians, if there wasn't strong evidence. So I'm going to look at that evidence, and then I'm going to discuss, discuss it. Um, this is a big talk, I'm afraid, because it's a big subject. So you can wake up now, please. Um, <laughs> uh, first of all, we know about variable adaption. Um, some parts of the population adapt more than others. For example, they've even introduced plants growing in Antarctica, you know, so the plants can... And the response can be rapid. Some people think that evolution can be slow, but it can actually move quite quickly and lead to all kinds of novel organisms. And sometimes all you need is a small selective advantage, like 1%. So we know about adaption. The DNA code, and I've, I've spoken about this before at other talks, and I'd love to talk more about this, but I haven't got time. The DNA code, where did it come from? It's almost universal, apart from a few minor and rare exceptions. And they discovered things called Hox genes. And these Hox genes are particularly important as small changes in these can have a major effect on body plans. So it's not a question of a, a small change, but it can be quite a big change with these Hox genes. But there are some questions about them. You see, their main role is to act as switches for genes that are already there. So they can't, if they switch us, they can't actually be the genes. So there is some problem with Hox genes, but they are a very important place. Then we find that there's the fossil records, which show progression with age. And so we sort of go from invertebrates to fish to amphibians to reptiles to mammals and finally humans. The order is as predicted by evolution. So we find that in the rocks. I've already mentioned that natural selection um, explains why trains of bacteria uh, strains of bacteria and pests develop. When the pests are the same, they also develop resistance as well. Then there's the presence of vestigial organs. For example, there are flightless beetles with wings, snakes with tiny legs under their skin, blind fish, whales with hind leg bones. One whale species has two vestigial hind legs that protrude from its body but seem to serve little or no function. We find wings on flightless birds, like ostriches, cassowaries, kiwis, of course, and kakapos. Um, and non-functioning eyes, as with some uh, cave dwellers and burrowers. And then we've got dandelions that have proper organs, stamen and pistil, necessary for sexual reproduction, like all flowers, but do not use them. Of course, sometimes an organ is adapted in an animal for a different use, e.g. wings for balance. Um, when it comes to humans, there's a reducing number of so-called residual organs. We keep finding uses for them. They're not really residual after all. And this has been reducing. And the number has dwindled from around 100 to a very short list. For example, the human appendix has a lot of useful roles, like the production of certain endocrine, endocrine cells in the human fetus, having some immune functions with young adults, and being the home for some good bacteria. Now, interestingly enough, the only mammals other than humans known to have appendices are rabbits, opossums, and wombats. And their appendices are markedly different from the human appendix. I'm sure you wanted to know that. Um, tons tonsils may be more important to help children fight off diseases. There are some barely used nerves and muscles that serve no useful purpose, such as the planta plantaris muscle of the foot. That is missing to some people. There are also some muscles that people can use to move their ears. Can anybody do that here? Move their ears? Okay, so uh, I can own your eyebrows. Uh, and the coccyx, of course, is necessary for sitting with comfort and provides a means of attachment of certain muscles. We have a third eyelid, or called nictating membrane. This is used for collecting foreign material that gets in the eye. Some organs may, of course, be described as leftovers from an earlier period of human development. 
but not necessarily from a pre-human species. We may be devolving, not evolving, and that would give some explanation to why we have these things. The next evidence is the existence of transitional forms. Now, this is a real problem for evolution because there's a big gap for transitional forms. But there are some put forward. Um, and what I've got here are those for frogs and salamanders, turtles, snakes, bats, flatfish, horses and whales, where they've found what they reckon are transitional. Of course, some people keep saying, well, we'll find them. And they've been saying this for a long, long time, for 150 years. Um, and it's, it's an evil of, evolution of the gaps argument this time. You know, we'll eventually find, find something in the middle if we look hard enough and they're looking. A biggie is the existence of what we call pseudogenes in humans. And these are kind of defunct genes. Um, they're sort of degraded relatives of functional genes which show our past history. In other words, they don't work anymore. They used to work, and if you look at other primates, you'll find that there's a relationship between ours that are defunct and theirs that are defunct, and that's why they're able to construct a, 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 a tree about human evolution um, from looking at those genes. We have a long genetic history. Of course, you could also argue that, and this is, I'm just reading this today, actually, I was looking at something I got from somewhere else, and I, I thought I'd be thinking about this, because if you've got similar genes, it could be that we have similar building blocks. You know, if God has a plan for how we are to be, there's no reason why he can't use similar ways of doing it. Uh, so there's a contrary argument. To all these arguments, there's usually a contrary one, uh, which doesn't help, of course. Um, and then we've got embryos, and you may know that um, embryos are many species, often very similar to one another as they go through the sequence, as with a human e embryo. Um, it's called um, evo-devo, or evolutionary development, which is another new developing subject. I won't go into that. And then, of course, um, nearly every part of the world has its own unique and distinctive animals and plants. So there is diversity. And how did that happen? For example, the mammals of Australia are mostly marsupials, or pouched mammals, and are generally unrelated to those found anywhere else in the world except for some distantly related ones in South America. Now, similarity can occur through what we call convergent evolution. For example, flying insects, birds and bats have all developed the capacity of flights, even though they're all very different genetically. They've somehow converged on this useful trait. And such features are called analogous features. And their common function arises in spite of the fact that their evolutionary ancestors are very, very different. So how did that happen? And another thing is, another feature is, in contrast, where their features are called homologous, where we have a common origin, but they don't have the same function. Sort of the reverse. Like the back wing, for example, is, is similar to human and other mammal forearms. And of course, if you wave your arms, you won't fly. Um, so the process of adaption is very common in nature, as we find different um, species and different methods of coping. I, I love these, these programs where you see insects and animals, you know, like, for example, the, um, the, the, the trapdoor spider. I mean, it's interesting you watch the trapdoor spider. They move like lightning, like, and then that's it, you're gone. Um, and then you've got spitting fish and flying fish. And, um, and interesting enough, plants also have a similar thing. Um, consider tendrils on vines. They can be used to support the plant or access nutrients and absorb and dissipate energy when there's strong winds. If the tendril finds no anchor, the vine, quote, decides to abort its investment and integrated senses come into play. The vine can alter its body plan by a chromatone modification related to the DNA. So even plants can get the message, you know, let's go somewhere else. Um, gosh, I see time is... Um, poor designs. I'll go quickly through these. Um, this is another argument for evolution. Pandas, some you probably heard about that. Whether it's actually a, a bad thing or not is not a matter because but the thumb doesn't work like a normal thumb, but it works okay for the panda. Um, pandas dine almost solely on bamboo. Mm. And because of their digestive system, they only absorb about 17% of what they eat. So they spend most of their time eating and sleeping, like some teenagers. Um, their digestive system suggests carnivorous ancestry. 
Um, then you've got in many animals, there's the inefficient route of the current laryngeal nerve that travels from the brain to the larynx by looping around the aortic arch. In other words, it does a, it's like going to Wellington by Wong Gray from Auckland. Um, not so great for the giraffe. But again, I've heard other contrary arguments say this is a good feature. And that people have talked about the eye, you know, the fact that things are upside down and you've got a blind spot. When you come to designing things, you have to compromise. If you want to buy a car, which, you get a car which is, which is both efficient and strong, you've got to compromise between light and weight. And so you're often, in a design, you have to some sort of compromise. And, and there's a lot of discussion about the eye, and I'm not going down that. I shouldn't have sidetracked myself. Um, an interesting one is that mammals have lost tetrachromatic vision, that's vision in sort of four colours, uh, as compared to other four-legged creatures. Uh, some fish, birds and insects have these four kinds of cone cells, whereas humans and close related primates generally have an, um, three, and it appears that some women have four. A rare number of them have an extraordinary colour range. Some women have amazing colour range. Um, gosh, I, I see the time, so I'm going to have to cut some of this short. Um, there are some anomalies with regard to bones and bird flight. For example, we can have strong but heavy bones not suitable for flight and occur in animals like bats, while unstable, light and even hollow bones that are more suited for flight occur in birds that cannot fly, like penguins and ostriches. Um, I'm going to cut down here. There's quite a few others. I've listed them all there. Um, let's see what we've got here. Bones and bird flight, non-coding DNA, uh, species with genes for non-existent features. That's right, there are genes which um, don't work out. Um, human problems, I will say something about those. Um, for example, in the human uh, reproductive system, there's a gap between the ovary and the fallopian tube that can lead to ectopic pregnancies. Um, and then there's the problem of birth, because the, the baby has to go through the pelvis and the baby's head's too large, the, the large has a problem. The females of other primates don't have this. Um, skip that. Uh, there are many human congenital diseases and genetic disorders. For example, we have something like 120 cancer predisposition genes. Mm -hmm. Human faces are much flatter than those of primates, but they all have the same set of teeth. Mm -hmm. uh, consequently, humans have a number of problems, such as overcrowding of teeth, um, wisdom teeth, and poor sinus drainage. Right, let's have a look at some problems with evolution. Um, Yes, sure. I'll make a comment. When all of those topics, as best I recall, that have been argued for poor design, I've yes. looked at several of them. Yes. I'm not impressed with any of them, really. They can all be debated, yes, I agree. I mean, they're, they're very debated. I haven't said one or the other here. I've just said that's, that's the viewpoint, and you will meet that. The, yeah. The point of design is that you can't say that something has been designed until you have some sort of appreciation for some sort of a specification for what yes. it is you're trying to achieve. So that topic, when people bring up poor design, it's yes. particularly Dawkins and the, uh, the wiring of the eye. It's very shaky stuff. Well, that idea where I said it depends on, on what you design for comes from your talk that you gave, do you remember? Yep. yep. And that's, that's, that's struck a chord in my mind, that the design has to be very... You have to balance A and B, and A and B can be quite different. Okay? Okay. Uh, now there's some... Pro Look, I want to get on with this. I don't want to get sidetracked. Is this exactly on this issue? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the other thing is that we're living in a fallen world and things are devolved, not evolved. Well, I've said that, yes, as a possibility. I haven't said yes or no. I'm just giving you the facts. Okay? Um, the The... Oh gosh, where am I now? I've got. Um, yeah, one of the problems with evolution is that, that you've got to have chemical evolution. You've got to have um, the right atmosphere. It's got to be what's called a reducing atmosphere. You've got to have hydrogen, ammonia, methane with very little oxygen to, present, to prevent oxidation. And otherwise, you can't get organic molecules formed in the ocean. They used to call that the organic soup. Now, I had some for lunch, it was really nice. Um, and it needs to be rich in amino acids. There's no evidence for this soup, and the atmosphere had a much more oxygen than we would like. So there is a problem here about the initial, uh, um, what the initial atmosphere would like. Then we've got the second law of thermodynamics, 
which implies that things don't get more complicated, they become more random. So how did complex molecules form? Um, a Nobel laureate called Ilya Prigogine said back in 1972, the probability that at ordinary temperatures a macroscopic number of molecules is assembled to give rise to the highly ordered structures and to the coordinated functions characterizing living organism is vanishingly small. What he's saying is it's virtually zero that these things can happen by chance. And he is a, a very famous scientist. Um, and I would argue that, that for, for random evolution to take place, we don't have enough time. Um, there's several finds which appear, again, recently of microfossils which suggest that life is very ancient, going back to the time when the Earth appeared. This would not allow enough time for random evolution. So um, and then the evolution of proteins is problematic. Uh, in my book, I list very, very small numbers for, to get a protein because you've got to have... Um, you've got to have particular bonds, you've got to have a particular type and the correct ordering of amino acids, of which there are 20. And the figure I give here to construct a simple one with 100 amino acids is 10 to the minus 90. It's a probability based on certain assumptions. Most mutations are harmful. And then you've got the evolution of complex molecules like DNA and RNA, and there's, there's three kinds of RNA. There's messenger, messenger RNA, transpose RNA, and, and ribosome RNA. Um, there are so much needed things to happen, which, for me, excludes chance. We have a circular problem. Proteins are required for DNA synthesis, and DNA is required for protein synthesis, which came first, the chicken and the egg. <clears throat> OK, the living cell is another one. The living cell, the cell is a marvel. It's a miniature city with information systems, transportation systems, refuse collections, factories, ambulances, police and gatekeepers. And this was said by a guy called Bruce Albert who was president of the National Academy of Sciences in an editorial describing the cell in this way. Then we've got our own physicist, Jeff Tallon, who's a, a very famous international physicist. He wrote a local newspaper article and said, the cell is a marvel of complexity, a miniature city with information systems Transformation systems, refuse, collection, refuse collections, factories, ambulances, police... Oh, it's the same one, isn't it? Which one did I read? Um, sorry. Anyway, you've got it twice, so maybe you might remember. But the, the, the amazing thing is that the human cell is, is like a complex factory, which does all these things, and they all have to work in order. Can that happen by chance? Each human cell has a half a million ribosomes, and to pick one, just one of those, 100,000 proteins... Um, yeah, this is, sorry, I've, I've got my quotes. I've got two quotes, and I've read you the wrong one. I'm sorry, you can read it for yourself anyway. Um, then we've got the Cambrian explosion of fossils. Some of you may have heard about that, that suddenly there was a sudden explosion of life where complete body plans were produced um, and, and very complex with no transitions. And so this has raised a big question of where did this happen, how did it happen? Um, and I've already mentioned the lack of transitional forms. I'll skip the last one and come back to that to a minute because I wonder now what imagination can do. They'll, they'll, find, they'll find, for example, just recently they found a jaw with a, a worn, out, worn down tooth in it. And they seem to think this was some sort of pre-ancestor of humans. Um, what imagination can do is you can get a picture like that. You start with a, a, a bone and you end up with somebody at a computer. Um, that's, that's how it's evolved. And um, there's the oldest, one of the oldest ones. I can't pronounce it. Um, but the, the, the jawbone was put together, pieces were broken, so they assembled it together, and then the face is what they came up with. Um, that's how I look first thing in the morning. And, and, <laughs> and, and the one on, on your left is, is how I am, uh, really. <laughs> Transformation. Uh, um, and then we've got um, Lucy. You may have heard of Lucy. Um, Lucy, there was, I think there were a large number of, of, of those found, about 300 individuals, all broken pieces they put together. Um, and they, they said, well, it's really a precursor of humans, but it's really an ape. If you look at all the various features, it, 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 it is, was sort of bipedal, bipedal. It could walk on two feet, but that doesn't mean it's upright. Um, there's two, the different thing between bipedal and upright. Um, and so that's Lucy. Uh, and then you've got um, pre-human families, Seven million years is what we've got here, and we've got 
different groups according to the colour. Now, what they said is they, they reconstruct a family tree. So the, we, we come from we come from apes down the line, um, and this one shows you brains and teeth, um, because those are the two things which are very different between apes and humans. Um, on the left-hand side, we've got time. So more recently, we've got um, a Homo erectus, um, which is well known, and the other one's Homo habilis, and other ones. And then you start at the bottom. And what's as you notice, the brain as as you go up, the brain gets bigger, and and as and also the tooth size um, is slowly getting smaller. Um, now, what is interesting, and I forgot to bring, I had a book which has got 700 pages in it. I was going to bring to you and say, now, look, suppose we have a look at this book. It's a, it's a mathematics book. And we suppose we let each 100 pages represent a billion years. So it's got seven, 700, 700 pages, 7 billion years. All right, I've got this book. OK, so I'm now going to shut my eyes. I'm going to tear a dozen pages out. OK? Now I'm going to say, here, I'll give the pages to you. You tell me what the book's about. And that's what this is about. <coughs> You're selecting a number of things out of this vast collection of stuff and building a picture. And in fact, one, of, one guy who is a, a well-known science writer, you know, the people that write for science, called Henry G, he said, um, first of all, the evidence for human evolution between 10 and 5 million years ago, so that's going back a long time, can be fitted into a small box. And he then goes on to say, a completely human invention, this is what it is, Created after the fact, shaped according with human prejudices, take a line of fossils and claim they represent a lineage is not a scientific hypothesis that can be tested, but an assertion that carries the same validity as a bedtime story. Amusing, perhaps even instructive, but not scientific. So you have this problem of trying to just construct a, a human evolution out of very little evidence. And of course, when they find something, everybody goes goes wild and think it's great. In this latest one about the tooth they found, there was a lady <coughs> interviewed, a scientist on, on TV, and she said, well, I think it's an ape. And I think it is too. Uh, I, won't, I won't go into that. So I'm going to stop, I think. I'm, I'm, I've, 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 got a, I've got something on differences between humans and that. There's Henry G. And, uh, and in particular, the ones which are interesting is we often think, OK, we're, if we've come from primates, why is it that intellectual capability and brain structure of ravens, crows and jays is much more similar to humans than they are for chimpanzees, orangutans and gorillas? Um, in one previous talk I gave, I talked about 007. 007 was a New Caledonian crow mm -hmm. that they'd been working with uh, at Auckland University, and this crow could do eight things in a row to eventually get some food. Figured out a series of eight things. Very intelligent. Um, so it's not a question of intelligence, it's, it's more than that. And then I've got other things here about our spiritual qualities. The fact that we have symbolic thought and communication. Animals do, are very similar to, to humans in lots of ways, and I could spend a whole talk about that. But we are very, very different. Humans and Neanderthals are a distinct species. There's no reason why. They did coexist at some stage. Um, and a human, a human can tame any member of a non-human bird or mammal species. We don't really see that anywhere else. And there's lots and lots of them. And I think I've probably said enough. Um, no, oh, yeah, technical advantage, complex. Language is very important. Humans have language. So now, animals do have their own communication. And there are people at Auckland University who study birdsong to try and work out what the language is. So anyway, that's by the way. I've gone over my time. I'm sorry about that. Um, I haven't covered everything, but I've tried to cover too much, so I better stop there. Thank you. <laughs> um, question time. <laughs> so, questions are probably the zoodles of them, because uh, <laughs> all I've done is is open up, in some ways, a whole lot of questions. <laughs> but you see, the point I'm trying to make is okay. Let's not get too excited about getting everything right. Because, as I said at the beginning, it's not essential for salvation. It's an interesting subject, and let's not get too dogmatic about our own particular view. But we need to show grace and consideration for people who are completely different from us over these views. 
So that, I guess, is my main message. And the other thing I want to say is that God is a God of new beginnings. No matter what happens in our life, we can begin again. And I say this not just as personally, but also as a counsellor, where I see people who can change their life and have a new beginning. And the second thing is that God created light, and we need to be light as well. We are the light of the world. So I'll just leave those two spiritual thoughts uh, at the end. Because that's what occurred to me when I finished this talk. Let's get back to theology and the meaning of it.